again, if you've never been on the battlefield, I highly recommend going because seeing the terrain right. it, with your own eyes and walking walking the ground, you realize just how challenging this is going to be because by the time you do see the sunken road, you're almost on you're top there, of it. Right. Um, and, and the guys in the sunken road are in a very, very well defilated position. No right? question about they, it. They have great cover. Um, they're in a position that in in if I if this was a modern battle, mm -hmm. if I had if I had my squad in the sunken road and we were fighting tal like a, a large Taliban force, they could outnumber us by a lot and we would be able to take the day. Oh, definitely, without a doubt, yes. without a doubt. And um, that's what happens. Yeah, and so D H Hill is the guy that's kind of in charge of things right. over there. Correct. So D H Hill has sent three of his brigades already to the cornfield that we've talked about. He's retained two. In fact, he's going to send those two, Robert Rhodes and George B. Anderson's brigades. He was actually going to send them to the cornfield when um, the, the setbacks occurred. And he says, we're just going to stay around the sunken road and hold our position. And Colquitt, who is beaten up pretty good, he's going to form behind uh, in, in the part of the sunken road by Hagerstown Pike. He's going to be joined by Cobb's Legion uh, or Cobb's Brigade, which was very small. It was beaten up at, at um, Frostdown Plateau. And then you have, on the other side of the Muma Farm Lane, you have um, Robert Rhodes's Brigade. They were beaten up at, Fr at Frostdown Plateau, remember? They're down to maybe 800 guys. And then uh, when the road curves to the right, then you have G.B. Anderson's North Carolina boys who were at Fox's Gap. They didn't do a lot at Fox's Gap. They, they did charge a battery, and they did take some losses. Um, but you have, but especially these two brigades of, of uh, Daniel Harvey Hill are the ones who are going to carry the fight for the most part. And here comes French's division, and as you said, over the hill. Now, one of the things that's confusing to many visitors of the battlefield is they see all these trees, and they say, how could they see each other? Well, most of those trees were non-existent. You know, yes, the north woods, east woods, the west woods, but the rest of it was completely bare. And it, they called this battle artillery hell. Good artillery placements, you know, platforms, and open area e equals a lot of casualties. Well, speaking of artillery hell, this is just something, when you said that, this just made me think about this. But um, not only do you have all the artillery on this side of the Antietam Creek, you know, where the actual battle is taking place, but you also have the 20-inch Parrot rifles oh, that are across yes. Antietam Creek as well. That's right. Um, and they're raining all kind of havoc on that area also. No question about it. And you've got Tompkins Battery um, that is near the current visitor center. That is firing so fast and furiously that l I never heard this before. The uh, barrels begin to melt. Get out of wow. here. You know, where now, they have the vents mm -hmm. that they'll thumb the vent. That becomes enlarged to the point where it can't, those cannons can't be used any longer. What kind? Are they, are they smoothbore? Are they Napoleons or are they uh, rifle guns? They are parrots, as so, I recall. Oh, wow. So they're not even brass. They're, they're straight up iron yeah, cannons they're iron. and they're and they're melting that's right wow that's and unbelievable I recall, is, yeah. and so they had to be replaced i never heard of i've never heard that either they had to be replaced so i mean they're also decimating uh those confederates in the in the sunken room and so and and a lot of people ask me about tactics during the civil war and i really can't answer it i mean you take fredericksburg uh you know i wrote the book maps of fredericksburg and most people never get to Prospect Hill. They think it's only um, Murray's Heights, Murray Heights, and the Stonewall at the base of it. But Stonewall Jackson's having his hands full further over. Rather than all of these Union brigades, divisions, and corps attacking at once, you have these single brigades. It's eighteen of them. One brigade defeated. Another brigade defeated. Another. I mean. It is so bloody that they're literally climbing over clumps of m dead men and dying men to get to this wall, and the same thing happens here at Frederick uh, at uh, with uh, with French. 
he doesn't launch his 6,000-man division against essentially um, probably about 1,000 guys. He could have overwhelmed them. In the first line, he has garrison troops under um, Weber, although they, he's, it's pronounced Bieber because he was German. Mm -hmm. um, and they're going to get stopped in their tracks at the top of the hill. Next, he brings up Morris's brigade, rookies. And not only are they firing into the backs of, the, of these garrison guys. Oh, my gosh. Get friendly fire. Awful. But also, when they finally get to the top of the hill, they're going to be decimated. And they fall back. And finally, you bring up Kimball's brigade, which is, you know, you always keep your veterans in the rear. They are your gold standard. You don't, they're not the cannon fodder. And so he is ordered to bring them up. Um, and they're not going to make themselves exposed. They're going to make themselves a small, lying down, crouching down. They're going to be firing into the sunken road, and that's when the Confederate casualties really start piling up. Because even though it's a good position, it's also very easily turned, it very easily and very quickly it turns into a, a death trap. No question about it. Um, and it gets only worse from there. It certainly does. And so what happens then is it becomes a standoff where uh, neither side can drive the other away. And that fighting, by, by the way, begins at 9.15 in the morning. So it's happening around the time that Sedgwick is getting beaten up. It's after the cornfield, still in the morning. About 11 o'clock, Israel Richardson's uh, division comes up. Now, they are experienced. These guys know what they're doing. He's got the Irish Brigade with him, right? Got Irish Brigade. You got Coldwell's Brigade. You got Brooks's Brigade. And these guys know what they're doing. And Israel Richardson is a very seasoned, experienced uh, division commander. Uh, fought at the, um, um, on the peninsula seven days. So he knows how to command a division, unlike French. And he's going to throw forward the Irish Brigade. And the Irish Brigade has been beaten up. Every battle it's been in, it gets beaten up pretty good. Its units were at the first bull run, um, second bull run, no, actually, they weren't a second bullet. Certainly during the seven days, they were gotten beaten up pretty good. Were not engaged on the 14th of September. But here they are coming over that hill. And remember, they, th their commander is Thomas Moore, Irish Revolutionary, does not believe in rifles, believes in smooth bore, close in fighting. Buck and ball kind of That's thing. That's correct. And many of the North Carolina boys in that um, sunken road, they've got a bloody lane. They've got, uh, they got rifles. So as the Irish brigade is coming over the ridge, which is a couple hundred yards away, maybe 150, they can't fire off their muskets. And so they're, they're, they're getting blasted to pieces between the small arms fire, but also the artillery fire of the artillery guns, of the Confederate guns. Um, but they keep coming, they keep coming, they keep coming and they will get close enough. They will blast those Confederates. Um, but again, they have a stalemate and this is, and I, I think I'm, I don't know if I mentioned this, the 69th, um, New York, one of the Irish regiments, they're the ones where their, their, um, flank, the right flank was resting on the roulette farm lane will lose over 63% of their men. Jeez. I mean, horrible. The other units, less, but still quite a few. And they can't drive um, Anderson's men away. And I, Anderson's men can't get rid of these Irish guys. And so um, Richardson is going to bring up the next brigade, which is John Caldwell's brigade. And... The Irish Brigade is still going to be in action as Caldwell's Brigade comes up. And this is happening between 11 and 12 o'clock. It doesn't take a long time. And I should mention that you have the Confederates have been reinforced now. Right, because uh, R.H. Anderson gets in the fight a little bit with the Florida Brigade. I yes. I have to give a little nod to the Florida Brigade. They get a bad rap here at Gettysburg because of uh, because of some press after the fact. Um, yeah. Which Georgian commander um, or South Carolina? There's a there's a brigade commander uh, from South Carolina or Georgia or something that almost immediately after the battle he starts writing writing a letter to a, a newspaper talking about how the Florida brigade kind of left him out high and dry. 
And um, and it turns out that's really not the oh, case. Oh, this was Ambrose Wright. That's it, Ambrose Wright. Yeah. And uh, they get a bad rap because of that. But yeah, they do. Um, but you know, I I. I, I like the Florida Brigade. They're they're they're, they're from my state, so. I can, well, okay. I, a lot a lot of them might not have been. A lot of them might have been from Georgia too. I know there was a lot of border yeah, crossing. Yeah, they had their problems at Antietam. Um, Rhodes when when Anderson Anderson's men have marched all night from Harpers Ferry. They're marching behind Lafayette McClaws's. Lafayette McClaws's men at least get a rest, not Anderson. So imagine <laughs> marching all night. You've not eaten, and immediately at 10 o'clock in the morning, you are, that's your destination over there, that, that sunken road. Go at it, guys. And almost immediately, and as you mentioned, Colby, the, the number of cannon on that guns of position, they're raining death all over the column. And, and one of the guys who gets wounded early on is Richard Anderson. Second in command is Roger Pryor, who's a brigade commander who is... He was an attorney. He was a newspaper editor. Uh, he was in politics. He wasn't good at anything, but he certainly wasn't good commander. <laughs> and the reg, the brigade, the division actually breaks apart. So this this very large, about maybe four thousand man division, that th- that the thinking is they might Richard Anderson might have known that he's going to hit the right flank of French's division. We don't really know because he didn't file a report, it just falls apart. And each brigade is marching toward the sunken road in a different way. And uh, the Florida boys are going to stay, and they're part of Fort Pryor's brigade. They stay in the orchard, which is behind the sunken road. Okay. And they don't know where to go, what to do, because Pryor is comp- incompetent, and whether he is commanding the division, we don't really know that. And it's interesting because Robert Rhodes will come out, General Rhodes. He sees these uh, Florida boys, and he, he rides over, and he finds Pryor. He says, I need those guys. And he gets, and Pryor gets them moving toward the, um, toward the sunken road. So it wasn't their fault. Yeah. They just didn't have orders, and they were, in, they were especially the 8th, was not uh, experienced. Right. You had, what was it, the 1st and the 3rd Florida, or the 2nd and the 3rd Florida? The 2nd, the 8th. And I, I think it was those two. I don't think, I think there was a twelfth, but I don't. Maybe think that's it. Were. I know like the numbers don't make sense how yeah. they have them numbered. But right. One of the Florida regiments goes out to the Western Theater, from what I understand, yeah. and then the other three are, gonna, are right. here. It's in the a East. very small brigade. Um, so you you were saying some stuff. You were talking about roads coming out. There's two things that uh, I I want to just throw out there. You don't have to tell them right now, but I want to make sure they get covered because they're very. Um, they're very descriptive of, of what this fighting is like, uh, and I want to make sure the audience gets to hear them. The first is um, uh, Gordon, uh, the yes. Confederate, him and his wounds that he suffers. And then also I heard a story about D.H. Hill yes. um, riding his horse over to Longstreet and Lee and being up on his horse and telling them that he needed, I don't know if he needed men or what, whatever he's going over to them for. Um, and he's, you know, he's... He's very agitated. It's the heat of battle, and he's in a hurry, and Longstreet's telling him, you better get off your horse. And, you know, he's saying, I don't have time to get off my horse. I need this or that or whatever. And Longstreet says, uh, you know, the, a cannon across the Antietam Creek, he sees poof, a poof of smoke come out of it, and he says, that one's for you. And uh, and then, you know, what, what happens as a wow. result of that. So those two stories, I, I, I feel like uh, they would be interesting to yeah, hear. Yeah, I think the first one, the second one might have been before a little bit before the battle and they okay. were they were around the uh cemetery and one of those cannonballs actually is going to take off the leg of i think um uh, daniel harvey hill's horse the front legs correct yes. so it just falls onto That's these correct. stumps yes. could you imagine that you're on a horse and all of a sudden its front legs are gone, <laughs> gone. yes unbelievable right. but hill will be very active i mean he is D.H. Hill is a very uh, aggressive fighter uh, to the point where um, during the Seven Days Battles and Seven Pines, they're afraid that he's going to be too aggressive. Now, <laughs> for most of these generals, you know, push, push, push. I, I want you to be more. He's too aggressive, according to Longstreet and others. I kind of like that about yeah. him. Yeah. 
and but very <laughs> caustic personality, hates everybody, <laughs> criticizes everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, so what happens is uh, you've got Anderson's, um, Richard Anderson's divisions come up, and they've really just flooded the sunken road. And it's there's there's a guy I also love his book Thomas Galway These Valiant Hours. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've read it. I haven't read it, but I know of the book that you're talking about. It's great. About. It's Stackpole. It's not been reprinted. I got it on Kindle for like three bucks or something. And he, he's now, he's with the 8th Ohio, which is part of French's, Kimball's men. He says, I'm seeing all these rebels getting into the sunken road. He says, I don't know how that road can, can handle so many hundreds and hundreds of men. And it can't. You know, they can't even move around. They're so squeezed together. Um... And what happens eventually, to make a long story short, is um, a couple things. One is, and it's getting toward 12 o'clock, you have Francis Barlow, who we all know from Gettysburg fame, Barlow's Knoll. He commands a, a couple of consolidated regiments, 61st and 64th New York. And he apparently sees the, left, the right flank of, uh, on the Confederate line in the sunken road. And on his own, he moves the, his regiments in that direction and hits their flank, rear, and front and just drives them and just rolls up the whole flank. And there is a mortuary cannon out there for somebody. Two mortuary cannons. One is for uh, George B. Anderson. And George B. Anderson is going to go. Now, he commands his North Carolina boys. Uh, who are there initially, he's going to go to the rear to confer with D.H. Hill. This is before Anderson comes up. And he's going to get himself shot. And when he comes back, he's going to get himself shot in the ankle. And the um, surgeons look at the wound and say, we don't have to amputate. Just stay off of it. You know, it should be fine. And he says to the surgeons, well, wait a minute. If I'm going to stay off of it, I might as well stay off of it at home in Raleigh, North Carolina, because my wife is going is expecting her first child. I'm going to get on a train. And the surgeon said, don't do that because it's bad. And that trauma is not going to go well. He says, ah, you guys don't know anything. Gets on the train. And that ankle, the wound so often, and so fascinating during the Civil War, wounds that aren't serious kill them. And wounds that are so deadly... Um, they survive. They survive. It's like Jackson at Pretty Chancellorsville. You know, it's kind of the same. That's right. Nobody thought he was going to die, but then he got pneumonia. And so what happens is um, it gets infected. It has to be amputated, and eventually it's going to kill him. On the 16th of October, not even a, uh, the anniversary of the battle, and he's, he's going to die just a day before his daughter is born. Wow. How so sad that's, is that? That's horrendous. Yeah, it really is. And it was it was potentially avoidable, and he was a good he was a good commander. So um, so you're going to have the line rolling up. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your persuasion, the two regiments on the left of, of George B. Anderson's line didn't know what was going on. And all of a sudden, you have all these Yankees descending on them. And they're going to sustain heavy losses, and, and many of them are going to be captured. It, it's, it's basically they're like fish in a barrel at this point. No question about it. Seems like it. Um, and what part of the of this fighting does uh, um, Richardson uh, get killed? Okay, so what happens is at the other end of the line you have Rhodes, and this is one of the mysteries. There are lots of mysteries. Why are these Why are these brigades attacking one after another after another, as opposed to the entire division just overwhelming the enemy? And Richardson's doing the same thing. Fredericksburg, they did the same thing. You know, you have at, at Gettysburg, you have individual brigades. You know, that's the attack, Longstreet's attack. Well, what happens is um, you have the regiment on the right is um, George Gordon's. And I think George Gordon is probably Lee's finest. I think he's better than than Longstreet. I think he's better than Jackson. I like him, man. I like this guy, him. And he's, he's not a military guy. No, but he... He likes to fight. He likes he's to fight. funny. Yeah, like what he says to his wife later in the day is is hysterical. And he knows how to he knows how to command troops. Mm-hmm. 
He almost rolled up the entire Union Army at the Battle of the Wilderness. He and, and at Spotsylvania twice he saves Lee's army. And you know, and he is going to be commanding a corps at Appomattox. His corps is going to be the last corps that actually launches an attack against the Yanks. He's the one that Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain talks about doing the salute on the horse, the the where he yes, bows his yes, horse. Yes. Um, which is also an incredible yes. uh, like little snippet of 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 history there. Just Indeed. hearing that is amazing. But um anyways, I'm sorry. So he is going to be commanding sixth uh Alabama, although he's a Georgia boy. And he's gonna he's never really been I don't think he's ever been wounded in battle before. And he gets wounded four times. Uh, a couple times in the arms, a couple times in the legs, and he's not vacating. He's staying with his men. They want him to vacate. No. And the third, the fourth, the fifth bullet will cre will I don't know if it hit I don't know if it creased or whatever. It apparently it was bad enough that he falls forward into his hat. Now he writes his memoirs, which are part novel, part. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you don't know what's true. He's, <laughs> right. He's like Chamberlain, you know. He yeah. embellishes, right? And he talks about very dramatically how blood is pooling up in his hat. He's mm. going to drown in his own blood, and then another Yankee bullet is going to uh, hit his hat. And the bullet's going to, and the, the blood is going to drain out. If it weren't for that, that bullet <laughs> hitting the hat, he would have drowned. Just at the right time. Now, from my under, just to deviate on him a little bit here, I, from my understanding, uh, whose division did he fall under? He's or, under D.H. Hills. Or, or I'm sorry, who, uh, whose wing? Was it Jackson or Longstreet that he fell under? Um, he was under Longstreet's wing. I be, well, it, it, it gets complicated. Well, who, because, because from what I understand, Jackson. His, his wife, wanted to be with the army all the time she was always trying to come to wherever the army was encamped and uh I th maybe it was jackson said you know he didn't want his didn't want gordon's wife being there you know right. jackson's very much like i'm on campaign this is this is yeah, the boys he, club no, right, no right, wives right. Yes. no wives and uh and by the end of the war that there were by the end of that stint that changes jackson yes. you know jackson says she can she can right. be there but um after he's wounded at Antietam, he's held up at some barn, some some on some farm away from the battlefield, and she comes to see him. And mm -hmm. it's obviously right. he's, I mean, he's just pieced up. He's got yes. bullet wounds everywhere, one in his face. And yes. Doesn't he say something along the lines of uh, when she walks in the door, he says, uh, "Hey, honey, come give your handsome husband a kiss or something, <laughs> something like, like that." Something like that, right? right. Else. <laughs> hysterical. He was a, he was a character. That's hysterical. So, um, he's out of action. And his second in command is a man by the name of Lieutenant Colonel James Lightfoot, who has never commanded the, the regiment before. And something happens that, again, is indescribable. And I, I can't understand what happens. But here you have a brigade commander. Robert Rhodes is pretty effective. He talks in his report about how his aide is wounded. He leaves the battle line to take his aide to the rear to get aid. Who does that? N not any good commanders. And he, admi and he admits it as though it was fine. Yeah, you, if you're, you're, not, you're not a good commander if you're doing that. Um, and so what happens is, before that happens, um, Lightfoot is saying to uh, his brigade, new brigade commander, Rhodes, what should I do? The enemy is infiltrating my right flank. Rhodes will tell this inexperienced uh, regimental commander, Simply turn your regiment, you know, turn to the swivel to the left, face the uh, offending Union troops and fire into them. That should take care of it. And instead, and then Rhodes leaves with his aide. <sighs> He's wounded. And for whatever reason, whether it was a misinterpretation, probably was, Lightfoot orders his men to about face march. Now, about face march is not swiveling to the right. And the guy, that's a six, uh, Alabama, is leaving the sunken road. The, and you can imagine the commander of the fifth Alabama, who's to the left, says, hey, is that just for you or is that everybody's orders? He says, I think it's all of us. <laughs> oh, geez. And the whole brigade is leaving the sunken road. And you can imagine the horror of Rhodes as he's riding back. All of his men are vacating. And, and he sees the Yankees from French's division, who are still on that side of the road, 
the lane coming forward to occupy, it's too late. So between that misunderstanding, supposedly, although it, it did happen, there's no question about it, and that flanking action on the other side, the Confederates are going to be vacating the sunken road. Now, we need to go back, and I talk about this on tours. Did the cornfield have any significant value? No. The significant value was the high ground around the church. The Dunkard Church. Earlier. It was just the op- it, w- it was just the, the where the fight took place on the, the way to the, the Dunkard Church. Right. Yeah. Did the sunken road have any uh, significance? No. The significance was, and I should get back and tell you that what the Yanks are really trying to do now is get toward Sharpsburg. They could see Sharpsburg in the distance, and if they can get into Sharpsburg, they can cleave Lee's army in half, and they can seal off his escape route to the Potomac River where there's a ford at Shepherdstown. Um, and so what happens then is that they've taken the sunken road, no significant value, but the significant value is straight ahead of them. And there's nobody ahead of them, in front of them, between Sharpsburg and them, except these de- demoralized, beaten Confederates. And there will be intense fighting for the next hour or so in the Piper Farm, which is that area. And D.H. Hill, who is, as I mentioned, a very, very aggressive, he's not going to, he's not taking this lightly. Legendary. Grabs, now, major generals do not have guns. <laughs> they do not have pistols. They do not have rifles. They have a ceremonial saber, which they never use. In fact, it's interesting. Stonewall Jackson. I'm trying to remember. I think it was Second Bull Run campaign. Yes, it was Second Bull Run. Uh, His men are getting defeated. He's trying to pull his sword out of his saber, (laughs) and it's rusted shut because it's just ceremonial. Right. And so he he, has to unhook it, and he kicks off the the charge with with the sheath still on the saber. That's (laughs) correct. That's correct. He grabs a musket. Major generals don't grab muskets. He gathers a couple hundred guys, and he's going to launch a desperate counterattack against these guys, mainly from Caldwell's brigade. And they just get pushed aside. Dade Shell isn't wounded, but, I mean, it's pretty desperate. And that fighting will continue for about an hour or so. And getting back to that other mortuary cannon, General Richardson, around where the observation tower is, you can see there's a big old tree to the left of it as you're facing it. Well, sort of behind it. There's a big old tree, and there was Graham's battery right there. He's trying to reposition that Union battery so it can, <clears throat> excuse me, it can infiltrate the Confederate position where this men are all demoralized, but that'll really drive him away. A Confederate shell, case shell, will explode over his head, and, you know, it's got all these dozens of these little ball, lead mm-hmm. balls, mm. They embed themselves in his lungs. Yikes. And so he's mortally wounded, and that's really going to have an impact on that attack. Right, because, I mean, from, from, from on any battlefield, if you're, you know, let's just, let's just if we're going to talk modern war, for instance, mm-hmm. uh, or as modern as we can where you have, like, a big battle. So, I don't, you know, let's, let's take World War II, for instance, and you have a company making a push through a sector of—, of German occupied territory. Right. And they've been in fight, you know, they've been in the fighting for a while and they have a very beloved company commander who's yes. led them through thick and thin. Mm-hmm. If if that company commander is killed more times than not, it sucks the wind right out of that. Oh company. yes. Very um, much so. And and they not that they become ineffective in battle, but they're not gonna have any kind of mom- momentum pushing them forward. They kinda they they kinda more times than not will end up just plopping down right, right. where they're at. And that, and also, it's it's going to take some time for them to find a replacement for Richardson. It turns out it's Winfield Hancock, mm-hmm. uh, who will ultimately assume command of his division. And that's going to take the wind out of the attack. They're running out of uh, ammunition. You know, they've been fighting for a while now. And they tell them, and they're, oh, and we're bringing up reinforcements that aren't coming up so fast. <laughs> So it takes the wind out of that attack. And so that desperate fighting at the sunken road, bloody lane, amounts to really nothing. 
And just for the viewer's sake, I mean, what does the aftermath of the sunken road look like? I mean, um, oh, I know there are pictures, but, but just description-wise, you know. Yes. And so photographers are going to, you know, one of the things that's interesting is this is the first battle that photographers come after the battle. Nobody knew what a battle looked like. Right, this is the first time in history anybody in the mm-hmm. civilian populace is going to see what war that's, looks like. That's right. Like, wow. actually, not that's a correct. painting, not a sketch. Nope. Real photographs. You're seeing the real thing. There's no glory, and they're seeing it. And unfortunately, what they're seeing is they're not seeing too many Union dead because they've already been buried. They're coming about three days after. What they're seeing is the, um, they're seeing uh, rebel dead. Lots of rebel dead. Excuse me. <clears throat> no, you're good. You're good. You can probably get rid of that. <laughs> anyway, um, it's it's one of the iconic photographs. There are lots of iconic photographs of this battle. One is Dunker Church, how beat up it was. Mm-hmm. Another is the hunt. I don't really want to say hundreds. Scores and scores of dead Confederates in the bloody lane. I mean, it, you, once you see it, you can't get it out of your mind. It, there are sections of the sunken road where you couldn't even touch the ground if you wanted to. Oh, there, were, there's no way. Walking there's through there's it. no section that you really can walk into. And for, it, on, the, on the peripheries, yeah, William Roulette will talk about 700 bodies being buried on his farm. Jeez. 700. Now, what are the overall casualty numbers in the sunken road? We're flight? looking at about 6,500 men are going to be killed, wounded, or missing in about um, three and a half hours. 